and I would ask that you leave the chamber quietly. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 21 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Keneally. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Senate to uh, the need for the Morrison government to take responsibility for getting stranded Australians home, including acting on the Halton Review recommendation to establish a national quarantine facility when the number of Australians who were stranded registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and wanting to come home has now doubled from 18,800 to, on the 20th of August, 37,000, and the number of vulnerable Australians has increased from 4,000 to 8,000 in just five weeks. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate time specific to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call senators. Oh, is the proposal supported? Beg your pardon. Yes, it, I believe it is, and I ask the clocks. The, to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Billick. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. One of the values that Australians hold dear is that they never leave a mate behind. Yet this is what the Morrison government has done to thousands of Australian citizens and permanent residents, those who have become stranded overseas due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of these Australians have been trying to return home for over six months. And when the pandemic stopped the world in its tracks, they heeded the government's advice to stay put if they had employment and living arrangements. As economic conditions deteriorated across the globe, many lost their employment, had to give up their leases and are now stranded in a foreign country with no income and no support. Where flights are available, there has been price gouging with many airlines forcing Australians to purchase business or first class, first class tickets in order to reserve a seat. Stranded Australians have turned to their government in their time of need. They would expect their government to move heaven and earth to help them, but instead the government's turned its back on them. We know of around 37,000 Australians stranded overseas, and this figure has doubled since August, and it keeps on going up as Australians register with embassies, high commissions and consulates. The number continues to rise despite the Prime Minister's hollow promise that he will get these Australians home and out of quarantine by Christmas. As of today, Mr Morrison has only 10 days to deliver on that promise. Does the Prime Minister seriously, seriously expect us to believe, with his track record so far, that he will get 37,000 Australians home within the next 10 days? I think not. About 8,000 Australians overseas are considered to be financially or medically vulnerable. This means they are facing the risk of, or in some cases currently experiencing financial hardship, poverty and even homelessness. Even for those with the means to get by in their host country, many fear that by the time they get home they could have lost their homes, jobs or livelihoods back in Australia. Now, one of my Tasmanian constituents stranded overseas contacted my office after he'd been discharged from hospital following a heart attack. He'd been unable to secure accommodation and was about to head to a homeless shelter. And another one who has been stranded overseas for seven months now has told my office that due to poor internet access, he's having great difficulty completing the online forms required by the Australian government or by, the, by Australian government agencies particularly uploading large documents. His phone provider recently cancelled his SIM card, which has prevented him from receiving the SMS codes required to withdraw money sent by friends. What is particularly concerning for him is that his insurance company recently cancelled his travel insurance because of Australia's ban on overseas travel. It's pretty scary to imagine how many other Australians are stuck overseas through no fault of their own, those that are without insurance cover and who will struggle to access health care if they have a serious injury or illness, 
including if they contract COVID-19. It's got to be a scary scenario, a terrifying scenario for many Australians. Imagine how isolated and vulnerable they must feel. Get an idea of how some of them feel. You only need to examine the Hansard transcript from public hearings of the Senate's COVID-19 committee. Peter, a Melbourne resident who addressed the committee while stuck in Serbia with her family, including her 79-year-old mother-in-law, posed this question to the committee. How am I supposed to instill a sense of national pride in my children and friends and people we know about being Australian when you've so poorly let us down? Peter also told the committee, the cap has abandoned my family and it's abandoned our citizens who are overseas. They're not stranded, they are abandoned by the government. The cap Peter was referring to is the limit placed on international arrivals and it's one of the main reasons why stranded Australians feel abandoned by this government. Adding to the sense of betrayal is the admission by the Department of Home Affairs that non-Australians with business, uh, businesses, innovation investment and student visas could be taking quarantine places from Australian citizens and permanent residents. Another stranded Australian, Diane, who was stuck in the UK when she addressed the committee, spoke about the sense of betrayal of being abandoned by her government. And she said, it just feels like a long-term boyfriend cheating on me. I've given my life to Australia and in my time of need, they have dumped me. Early in the pandemic, the government belatedly helped organise some flights for Australians in Wuhan and passengers of the Diamond Princess in Japan but they haven't done nearly enough to repatriate stranded Australians. In fact, they have spent substantially more taxpayers' money chartering flights out of Australia for lobsters, prawns and abalone than they have spent chartering flights into Australia for Aussies stuck overseas. It's shocked and appalled many Australians that this government spends over $4,000 an hour on an RAAF plane to help former Senator Matthias Cormann lobby for his OECD job, and yet they can't task RAAF planes to help get Australians home. Most of the Australians who have thankfully been able to return um, back to Australia have done so on their own initiative. Some have come together with understanded Australians to book and share the cost of charter flights. And in doing so, they have undertaken a task that the government should have been doing months ago. There are three simple actions that Labor is calling on the Morrison government to take to help Australians stranded overseas get back home. One, increase the caps on international arrivals so that more Australians can return to Australia. Two, stop the price gouging by airlines flying into Australia. It's outrageous that simply to get home, some Australians are being forced to pay as much as $15,000 in airfares. Three, use all possible flight options to bring stranded Australians home, including working with airlines, to increase the number of commercial flights, charter flights, and using the fleet of the Royal Australian Air Force. There are thousands of Qantas and Virgin workers currently on JobKeeper and hundreds of planes sitting idle. And we acknowledge Qantas has provided some repatriation flights, but why isn't the government asking the airlines how they can use more of their spare capacity to bring more Australians home. Mr Morrison could also deploy the RAAF's fleet of VIP um, aircraft around the globe. As I said earlier, the government seems to have no trouble tasking an RAAF aircraft to fly a former Liberal Minister around Europe and provide him with eight staff so he can apply for a job. Mr Morrison has spent months dismissing our calls to use the RAAF fleet to bring stranded Australians home. Yet he thinks the extravagance heaped on Mr Cormann is okay. And what was the Prime Minister's glib explanation for this? He might get COVID. So does Mr Morrison not think that the 37,000 Australians stuck overseas might also be at risk of contracting COVID-19 too? And a lot of those would be at risk in countries where they've got no health insurance uh, cover. It's unconscionable that the government is putting one of their mates ahead of vulnerable Australians. 
Mr. Morrison keeps blaming hotel quarantine arrangements for his government's lack of progress. He keeps pointing the finger at the states and the territories because we know he's never to blame for anything. But he is trying to pull the wool over Australians' eyes. He knows that his government could expand quarantine arrangements. He has clear and thorough advice from the Hotel Quarantine Review about how the federal government could do this, including advice to run quarantine under federal legislation and to open up further quarantine facilities such as the RAAF's Learmont base. And Morrison's government failure to take the necessary actions to get stranded Australians home. It's a dereliction of their duty to their country citizens, and it's a breach of these citizens' human rights. It's an indelible stain on the record of this government that they abandoned thousands of Australian citizens for months when they were at their most vulnerable and looking to the government for help. This absolute lack of care and concern for thousands of vulnerable Australians is outrageous. Australia should have a reputation for looking after its citizens abroad. But when turning to Mr Morrison's government, you're on your own. For anyone listening to these proceedings right now who want to add their voice to the thousands calling on the Morrison government to rescue stranded Australians, I encourage you to sign Labor's petition. And you can find this petition online at www.alp.org.au slash stranded Aussies. Thank you, Petition Senator Billick. Your Labor. time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I acknowledge that the motion with which we're dealing with now reflects it's signed by Senator Keneally, of course, and it reflects a drum she's been banging for some time. But I've got to say, with this motion, the pattern that I have observed, and I'm sure many people in this chamber have observed, of Senator Keneally overreaching on matters in the home affairs portfolio has reached a new high. Because if you're a person of my vintage, and I, you may well be, Mr Acting Deputy President, you might remember Inspector Gadget. Now, I liked Inspector Gadget as a kid. He had these extendy arms and legs that were very handy for um, the adventures that he would have. But you know, not even he, with his super extendy arms, could reach as far as Senator Keneally tries to do so often with her efforts in the home affairs portfolio. Overreach is the order of the day when it comes to Senator Keneally. And the overreach here is so spectacular that even with his extendy go-go gadget arms, Inspector Gadget would also topple over. So let's start with the first of those overreaches. First, her reference to the Halton Review recommending a national quarantine facility. Well, that's overstatement number one. Got the report right here, the, the relevant pages of it, and among a range of matters that are canvassed in that report, there's a suggestion for the government to, quote, consider a national quarantine facility, quote, in reserve. Not we must establish one now, the way Senator Keneally puts it, not the current status of demand requires it, but rather, if or when required, should there be a need to scale up services significantly and at short notice. A far, far cry from the land of overreach that Senator Keneally inhabits. And as you would expect, perhaps, Mr Acting Deputy President, her overreach doesn't end there, because Labor who protests perpetually that immigration detention is cruel and barbaric and wrong, now wants to reopen immigration detention facilities and put Australian citizens in them. Well, they treat the government as though they're doing the wrong thing by refusing to reopen immigration detention centres immediately and filling it full of Australians who've been overseas. I mean. <laughs> It is not wrong for the Australian government to canvass and pursue every option to avoid putting Australians in immigration detention, if at all possible. Perhaps Senator Keneally might also like to you know, mix some Australian citizens who have been overseas in with some of the convicted criminals that we have in immigration detention waiting for deportation, or perhaps 
send them in with the other non-criminal people but who are nevertheless in immigration detention because they're not entitled to be here in Australia. I mean, this is the most hare-brained scheme I think Labor's ever come up with. And yet they come in here and argue it as though putting Australians in immigration detention would be some kind of supremely moral position. It truly is a bizarre thing. And then we go to the next one of her spectacular overreaches. Pretending that it's the Commonwealth Government that is forcing the imposition of caps on the numbers of people who can return to Australia each week. Perhaps that's the biggest dishonesty of the lot. Another overreach, those go-go gadget arms extending again to the point where every sensible person can see Inspector Topple. But of course, the smart Australians won't be fooled. They know that the caps are driven by state governments requiring hotel quarantine. They know that limit means that the number of people who can return has a natural ceiling associated with the number of hotel rooms available. And they know that the vast majority of the heavy lifting on bringing people back has actually been delivered by the New South Wales government through Sydney Airport. Now, are there other options that could be considered for bringing more Australians home? Well, yes. And is home quarantine perhaps one of them? Perhaps. Maybe more testing and shorter quarantine periods at either end of an international flight? It might also be worth exploring. But those are matters that lie in the hands of state governments. And the confected outrage that we hear from those opposite is a smokescreen for the reality that the states, in overwhelmingly Labor governments, hold the reins on this issue. Maybe Senator Keneally should pick up the phone to one of her Labor mates, maybe Premier Palaszczuk, maybe Premier Andrews or Premier McGowan, and start to negotiate with them a more reasonable attitude. But I'm pretty sure they don't want to throw Australian citizens in immigration detention either. Not least of which the fact that under the proposition that's being put opposite, it'd have a whole lot of Australians return to immigration detention for Christmas. Now, to point out the madness of what's being argued by those opposite is not to dismiss the seriousness of the situation. There are Australians overseas who want to return. And we need to do all that we sensibly can to get them back as soon as is possible. And we're keenly aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of global travel restrictions that result or have arisen because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so DFAT is helping vulnerable Australians. They're doing that by facilitating access to flights back to Australia, importantly, providing financial assistance where that's required through what's called the hardship program, because we know that at a time when the global market for aviation has taken such a big hit, it's just not as economically viable for flights to be as cheap as they were some months ago. So we're providing help for people to meet that higher cost that many are facing. And we're continuing to provide professional and responsive consular assistance to those people who are in need. And so many Australians have been able to return. Not 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000. We have facilitated the return of more than 432,000 people. 432,000 people since the government advised Australians that they needed to reconsider their plans to leave Australia for overseas travel. DFAT has helped over 31,000 Australians return on over 370 flights, including almost 11,000 people on 74 government facilitated flights. Ten commercial flights have been facilitated by government since just the 23rd of October, and they've returned over 
1,500 passengers—1,583, to be precise. And that includes one that arrived in Darwin from London today, a Qantas flight from Delhi that landed in Darwin on Saturday. There is a steady stream of Australians being brought home, and that's happening as soon as it's practical to do so within the limits that have been set by National Cabinet at the insistence of state governments because they're the ones that impose this hotel quarantine requirement and they're the ones that face the, the management associated with imposing that rule. Since the 18th of September, over 39,600 people have returned from overseas, including more than 15,300 Australians who had registered with DFAT. Now, of those, more than 3,400 were vulnerable people. We are taking the necessary interest in making sure that people who are in hard situations, whether that's because of their health, whether that's because um, of their ability to meet living costs in the place that they're located, whether that's because of the cost of flights back, we're doing what we need to to make sure vulnerable, pe vulnerable people get the hand they need. And while the global pandemic is far from over, and we don't know when we will return to the normal state of international travel, Australians can be assured of this, that we do very much care about getting them home safely, and that at the federal level we are doing everything within our power to make sure the road home for them is facilitated as swiftly and as safely as possible. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. This pandemic has been challenging in so many ways. There's been so much hardship, so much hurt, so much suffering. And not least amongst that hardship and hurt and suffering has been the plight of the tens of thousands of Australians who are stranded overseas. And that number is increasing, and it's not surprising. As you see, the pandemic making such huge impacts all around the world. People want to be able to come home. At the COVID committee hearing just on Friday, we heard that the numbers have increased from the 18,800 as they were on the, on the 20th of August, just a few months later, despite the people that have come home, we are now at 37,000 Australians who are saying, please, let us come home. And at that hearing, we heard DFAT acknowledge what the Prime Minister has been unwilling to acknowledge, and that's that they are not all going to get home by Christmas. On the 18th of September, the Prime Minister said, I would hope that those who are looking to come home that would be able to do that within months, and I would hope that we can get as many people at home, if not all of them, by Christmas. It's very clear that that's not going to be ca the case. In fact, we are going to fall well short of that. I did some quick sums during the hearing last Friday when we were told that over September and no, over October and November that there had been 7,000 people that had been returned home each month. So 14,000 throughout September and October. We were told that there's going to be some increase in quarantine spaces over the coming months because there are going to be some flights coming into Melbourne. There's going to be an increase in quarantine facilities in Tasmania and the ACT. But when I questioned, well, just how many more does that mean? Up from 7,000 in a month, what are we going to get up to? 10,000? Perhaps even at a max, we might even get to 15,000 a month. I wasn't um, contradicted. In fact, I would say that the likelihood is probably over the coming month, and it is only, it's less than a month to Christmas, it's, we're going to be lucky if we get another 10,000 Australians being able to come home. And of course, that, only me that means that only half of that 10,000, only about 5,000 of those 37,000 Australians stranded overseas are actually going to make it to be home with their loved ones by Christmas because of the two weeks quarantine that's required. So of those 37,000 people that in September the Prime Minister said we'd be hoping to get them all home by Christmas, we're looking at actually only 5,000 of them being able to get home. And in fact, at the rates of quarantine availability, we're going to be lucky if those 37,000 people all make it home by Easter time. They're going to be stuck there for many months longer. 
And this is tragic because each one of those people is suffering in their own way. They are people, there are people who are running out of money. There's people whose leases have run out, who have got nowhere to stay. There are families caring for their children who are worried, desperately worried, that if both parents catch COVID, that they haven't got the family networks or the support networks to have somebody else looking after their children. And this is a real risk. I mean, if you look at the tragic statistics in the United States at the moment, where in North Dakota, one in a thousand people have died of COVID. One in a thousand. That means we're looking at about one in ten people having caught it. These are really scary statistics. And if you're an Australian living in somewhere in the world with that sort of prevalence of this virus, you would be desperate to come home. And what also makes this such a tragedy is that there is something that we can be doing. There is a solution to this. What we heard on Friday, and it was confirmed, that the limitation it's not the number of flights, it's not the number of places on flights, it's the quarantine facilities. It's having spaces available for people to quarantine in Australia, which means if you put the resources in, there are facilities all around the country that could be being used for quarantine. We could lift the number of quarantine spaces tomorrow by putting those resources in. And this is a federal government responsibility because it's the federal government who are, who, whose responsibility it is to be looking after Australians and, and our borders. So it is, and of course, it was a recommendation, as the motion says, it was a recommendation from the review that Jane Holton undertook to establish a national quarantine facility. There is a role that the federal government could be playing that this government is not playing. And I want to acknowledge the important work of Amnesty International in this debate in bringing attention to the plight of those stranded overseas, including through their report, Stories of the Stranded Aussies. As that report notes, there is a clear breach of human rights in the Liberal Party's actions to leave people stranded overseas. And they say the Australian government has an obligation under international law, including Article 12.2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 12.4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to bring these people home. And they are not meeting this obligation. So we've got a breach of international law and we've got a government that could be taking action but is not taking action, not meeting this obligation. And that goes, takes us to a really important point about this pandemic. It shows where your values lie. It's when the world's turned upside down, when hard decisions have to be made. And we've now seen what the Morrison government has decided. They have decided to leave Australians stranded overseas. And the Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be protected and respected in all countries and in all places, and, and for all people. And when you apply a human rights framework, to the actions of countries, you can't pick and choose and say it's okay for some countries to protect human rights and it's okay for other countries to abuse them. And it means as a country that we have to keep challenging ourselves to make sure that we are living up to our human rights obligations. It is our responsi responsibility to call out human rights abuses in other countries and it is our responsibility to be respecting the human rights of our citizens. So we need to be getting people back to Australia. We need to be acting on black deaths in custody. We need to be not locking up asylum seekers in indefinite attention. We need to be bringing our citizens home. But while they claim that they value Australians, I mean, this government, the Liberal National Party government, has refused to take any ownership of this issue. And we just heard Senator Stoker basically saying once again, no, 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 it's all a matter for the states. I mean, the Prime Minister has got a nose for a photo op. He can sniff out a shining announcement a mile away if he wants to be part of it. But when it comes to the real issues that people want help with, well then, no, it's a question for the state premiers. 
But meanwhile, of course, they have shown where their real priorities are. I mean, Matthias Cormann hardly had time to exit the building, and we've got a RAF jet at $4,000 an hour sort of flying him, whisking him around um, at great expense to be trying to get a cushy job. It really goes to show it's one rule for everyday people and another rule for the Liberal mates networks. So look, I want to be very clear. While the government has let Australia down during this crisis, there is a better way. Quite early in the crisis, we understood that there's a massive need for governments to intervene to be looking after people and protecting our people. And that's why we released our Invest to Recover plan. I mean, that report recognised that we face and continue to face a pivotal moment. We said for many people things haven't been easy for a long time, but the inequality crisis fuelled by the neoliberal politics of the Liberal and Labor parties has been supercharged by the current health crisis and its disastrous economic consequences. And while we're rightly focused on responding to COVID-19, the climate crisis that drove the devastating bushfires earlier this year has not gone away. By recognising that this is a pivotal moment, we can take real steps, tremendous steps that will make a real difference for people, for communities and environment. We can intervene. We could invest and bring Australians home by Christmas if we wanted to. It's not a matter of money. The government spending ten, hundreds of billions of dollars, no, $99 billion in giving handouts to their big corporate mates. They could spend the money if they wanted to. I mean, this is a moment in time, and the Liberal Party is betraying future generations by not seeing it. They have let down thousands of Australians overseas and left them stranded. It's Thank not you, Senator good enough. Senator Rice, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And uh, I too would like to make a contribution in this uh, urgency debate. And, and to start with, I just want to put clearly on the record, as I think Senator Keneally and others have done, the constitutional requirement for the federal government to oversight quarantine is, you know, it's clear. It is a Commonwealth government responsibility to oversight human quarantine. And I think anyone who's going to write with perfect 2020 hindsight, uh, the history of this pandemic, uh, that is going to be one of the clear failures of this government to not immediately take action, to immediately put in place uh, across the board rules in each state and each territory to safeguard the quarantine of, uh, of uh, the nation. And if you look at the Halton report, quite contrary to perhaps popular opinion, the, uh, the instance of uh, travellers uh, returning being, uh, having a positivity rate uh, is 0.66 per cent in the two weeks to 30th of August 2020, and a rate as low as 0.30 per cent based on 22 diagnoses of COVID-19 in excess of 6,500 international travellers. Now, we know that one uh, case is capable of being um, you know, affecting community transmission and being an exponential uh, growth in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the rate of uh, contacting the virus. But I think when the, when the history is written, it's going to be very clear that the Commonwealth had an opportunity and it saw the Ruby Princess, it saw the Victorian experience, a similar smaller experience in South Australia, where if there had been one set of rules across the nation on, in the states and territories in respect to how we were going to treat this quarantine issue, there would have been less failure in repatriating people quickly and effectively. And I mean, I know my home state of South Australia, and, and it's a very popular political decision uh, to cease taking any, uh, any more international travellers until we get uh, our situation firmly under control once again. And I know from speaking to many people in my street, in my neighbourhood, that it's very popular. They say, oh, we shouldn't bring them back. We shouldn't bring them back. We should you know, be very hard on it. Why are they over there anyway? Well, they're over there because that's what Australians do. I gave my daughter a 21st birthday present, which was a round-the-world ticket, and it took her four years to come home. Fortunately, there was no pandemic in that time. But had there been a pandemic, I would have been moving heaven and earth and everything else to get her you know, home as quickly as possible. And I really feel for these people who are stranded overseas 
in dire circumstances. I read the story the other day of a, a woman who lost their job because of the uh, infection rate in London and was now couch surfing and desperately trying to get a, a seat home. And, and it's true. We could bring them home. It's not, it's, as Senator Rice has said, it's not the, it's not the lack of um, planes and seats. It's the lack of a coordinated approach to quarantine. And the ad hoc nature of that uh, implications of it devolving that responsibility to the, state, to the states has set us back 100 years, in my view. Quarantine is simply, human quarantine is simply a Commonwealth responsibility. This government should have done better. And I'll just throw this out. In, at the 13th of July 2015, we had 637 asylum seekers detained in Nauru RPC. I don't think many Australians would realise the costs of running that RPC in 2015, figures of the department, to 30th of April 2015, were $350,419,000. So looking after 500 people, this government was prepared to spend, when you add in the operational costs, the staff costs and the capital costs, nearly half a billion dollars. Well, I'm sure, faced with what appears to be a fairly successful operation in the Northern Territory in Howard Springs, where people come in, and I heard early Sunday morning as I drove over to Canberra, uh, a woman ring um, the ABC program, whatever it is, Macca all over, uh, and say, I am so relieved to be here. And all my cohort is so relieved to be here. And we're so thankful to be in the Northern Territory, in a fairly open environment rather than a closed air conditioning inner city hotel. I mean, most of us in this chamber spent far too much time in hotel rooms. I could not imagine being put in an air-conditioned, um, no window, no balcony hotel for 14 days and not allowed out for, for anything, basically. It would be extremely... Um, it would be tough on your mental health. It would be tough on all sorts of things. So I think that the government had an opportunity to take control and a constitutional obligation to take control and the Ruby Princess was one area where it failed. And I think, when this, as I've said, this, when this history is written, it's going to be classified as a, at least an abrogation of the uh, constitutional uh, position of the federal government. And I know that there's a lot of politics being played around uh, each state and each territory. And COVID incumbency is a very powerful thing. We've seen that over a couple of elections now. And I know that uh, the Premier in uh, Western Australia has been the hardest of all, hardest of all, in terms of uh, implicating his strong border protection. And, uh, you know, they've faced a, a High Court challenge and uh, won that. So basically it's not going to change in a hurry. But we've got to think for these 37,000 Australians who probably are becoming increasingly desperate. And Australia is a travelling nation. When we get back to a million Australians overseas at any one point in a year, uh, perhaps we need to have a bit of foresight and look, if there is a problem, what are we going to do? Is it all going to be ad hoc? Are we going to just allow it to stumble and bumble along? Clearly the constitution written by our founding fathers gave the Commonwealth human quarantine as an obligation. And I think it's very clear in this, uh, this Scott Morrison government, uh, the Honourable Scott Morrison, has failed Australians in that respect. And when you contrast what, you know, in another natural disaster like uh, you know, Cyclone Tracy in Darwin, the place was evacuated in three or four days. They threw everything at it. Set a record of passengers on a plane. I was working at Darwin Airport in those days, so I saw it firsthand. The government saw Australians in need and did something immediately and straight away. And if they spent one-tenth one tenth of what they did on five or six hundred IMAs, irregular maritime arrivals, then this problem would have gone away. But that's not the case. We're now looking at people who may not get back to their families for Christmas. And I think it's a crying shame that, you know, a federal government has done a lot of good work in this area. I can't be critical of, you know, the government in terms of job keeper and that sort of thing. Done a lot of great work, but I think it increasingly is becoming more and more obvious in the matter of human quarantine, they abrogated or failed in their responsibility, and that is to Scott Morrison's enduring shame. And I think the legacy will be written. 
at least an abrogation of their responsibility, if not a downright failure of their responsibility. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Um, if, if you were to listen to Labor, this government is heartless, uncaring and unfeeling towards the plight of our citizens who are overseas. But nothing can be further from the truth. And Labor are very, very loose with their rhetoric and very loose with their facts when they, when they grab at the heartstrings of Australians to paint the Morrison government as a heartless, unfeeling government that is quite happy to see our citizens languish overseas at the expense of all others. As I said, nothing can be further from the truth. From the very get-go, at the beginning of this pandemic, as early as January, we were talking about what this may mean for international travel. We closed our borders to people coming in from China very early in the piece. In March, our government made people overseas aware that they should seriously consider returning home if there was no requirement for them to stay overseas. And certainly many people did so. And yes, we acknowledge that those who chose not to at the time had their reasons. They may have been in stable employment at the time. Their family circumstances may not have allowed it. And we totally accept that. And no one should be derided for having made the choice to remain where they were. And some of those people now want to return home for, again, for a variety of reasons. And we are working very hard to facilitate that, to ensure they can come home. Since March, we've returned over 420,000 Australians to our shores. They have returned home. They're back with their families. And indeed, my office has had many phone calls from people thanking our government for helping them to return home safely without the risk of, going, of getting COVID when they get home. And let's not forget, back in March, National Cabinet agreed on hotel quarantine for all arrivals. National Cabinet, all of the state governments and the federal government all agreed that hotel quarantine would be the method that we would apply to ensure that people returning to our shores can do so safely, monitored, securely, to protect our Australians here on shore as well as themselves. And since that time, we have been doing just that. The state governments let us know how many that they could deal with safely and effectively using whatever processes they chose to use. They identified the caps. The state governments identified the caps. And on that note, I commend the New South Wales government for having a cap three times higher than the other states, or nearly three times higher than the other states. We know, and as Senator Keneally knows, because we heard in the COVID committee, the Senate Select COVID committee, that hotel quarantine is the reason why Australia has been so successful at controlling the spread of the virus and vi the virus coming into our shores. We also know, unfortunately, what happens if we push our hotel quarantining system too hard and if we don't have effective control mechanisms in place, because we've seen what happens with Victoria and their tragic second wave. Thankfully, that is over. But we don't want to see that again. So we are committed to ensuring that our hotel quarantine system, working with our state governments, is effective and managed appropriately. We also heard last Thursday at the Senate committee that the result of Victoria's second wave meant that Victoria shut down their borders completely. They didn't accept any 
returning Australians, and that had a significant impact on our capacity to reshore our citizens from overseas. But fortunately, Victoria are set to handle foreign arrivals again, and hopefully this time with much needed improvements to their hotel quarantining. This is all to ensure the safety of Australians, the safety of Australians both returning home and the safety of Australians onshore. I mean, the other thing that Labor says is that we should just open a national facility. Where? Where can we open this national facility? Senator Keneally last Thursday suggested we reopen our closed detention centres, such as Port Hedland and Baxter. I never thought I'd see the day when Labor was saying we should reopen our detention centres. Now, believe me, Mr Acting Deputy Chair, our government has looked at all options, and we have looked at those closed detention centres. Detention centres we're very proud to have closed because we addressed other border issues. But those ones, Port Hedland and Baxter in particular, they're not currently fit to put people into. So you cannot wave a magic wand. This is my message to Senator Keneally. This is my message to Australians out there, because this is about managing expectations. You can't have present a motion to this chamber and miraculously be able to manage 35,000 people pouring onto our shores with nowhere to go, nowhere to be effectively quarantined and not risk our population. Because we're seeing of the arrivals that we're currently dealing with, over 1 per cent of them have COVID. But we're containing that because we've got effective quarantine. The other option that Senator Keneally put forward was Christmas Island, the currently closed areas of Christmas Island. Now, the part, parts of Christmas Island detention centre that are fit for use at this point in time are being used. There is no extra capacity there. We have worked with the Northern Territory government We've reopened the Howard Springs facility, which is currently taking 500 people a week, and negotiations are ongoing to expand that. We've also now negotiated with Tasmania and the ACT, who have now graciously allowed incoming passengers from overseas within what they believe they can effectively manage. This government is doing all it can. We have facilitated 72 repatriation flights to date. That are flights, they are flights wholly and solely committed to people who've registered on DFAT. But the other point that Labor make is that the list of Australians wanting to return home is growing. And that is true because there are people overseas at this moment, Australians overseas, and their situations change. So that list will fluctuate and it will grow as people want to come home and it will, might decline again as people, uh, things settle down overseas. But to hold the claim that our government has failed on a key promise, which even Senator Keneally's own quote from the Prime Minister Scott Morrison wasn't a promise, he said, we hope, we hope to have all Australians home by Christmas, as who were on the list on that day. And yes, the list has grown. But since that day, we have had more than 35,000 Australians returned home, which was a far greater number than was originally on the list on the day that the Prime Minister said he hoped to have them return home. So we are very committed to doing all we can to return Australians home in a way that is safe, in a way that ensures we maintain our very good and very strong record 
on containing COVID on our shores. But my message to everyone listening today is we haven't forgotten our Australians overseas. We are doing all we can Thank you, Senator effectively. Daly. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to support this urgency motion this afternoon because the pr Prime Minister of our country has issued a statement of false hope to the thousands of stranded Australians when he said he would get them home before Christmas. We know uh, that this promise uh, was to 26,800 Australians who at the time were registered as stranded with DFAT. That was back in September. Now we know that the number of Stranded Australians who want to come home now stands at some 37,000, and we do expect uh, that it's quite likely that that number will grow. In that time, we know we've seen uh, 35,000 Australians come, come home since the outset of the pandemic, and I think it's a bit rich to say, well, we've already got 35,000 people home. Many of those people came home quickly, as they were instructed to, uh, uh, under their own steam, no thanks to the government's assistance. Of those 26,800 uh, who were registered with DFAT back in September, 14,000 of them have been able to come home. And I know uh, the great joy and indeed the ending of stress and suffering that comes with families being able to be reunited. Uh, I've seen that firsthand among close friends and family about what a difficult and stressful time this has been, with dozens of tickets booked and dozens of tickets cancelled by airlines, people being bumped from flight after flight after flight. Now, the government says, has said, uh, they've tried to cast some blame at state governments for needing to be rational about the number of people that they can afford to let into each state in terms of safely managing those quarantine provisions. And I do understand there has needed to be some limits in order that quarantine can be safely uh, managed. But I have to say, that when the government said it was organising to prioritise Australians over other people wanting to enter Australia, uh, our inquiries at estimates demonstrated that there was no such plan to ensure that Australians uh, had priority over other people who the Department of Home Affairs has issued a visa for. Up to 70 uh, international students arrived into Darwin this week, and I know that universities made their own private uh, arrangements to be able to do that um, so that they could be safely quarantined. But I fail to see how the government can use as an excuse the lack of suitable options for uh, quarantine provision around the country uh, and that they fail to make provision for that when indeed universities have been able to, in this case, make accommodation uh, for those 70 international students to be able to quarantine. 300 Australians, uh, sorry, 300 foreigners, which should have been 300 Australians, uh, were, uh, were allowed into the country and allowed to take up a place in quarantine by this government when visa holders in business and innovation investment program were issued visas. And when we asked in estimates how this was possible, they said, well, once they'd been issued a visa, it was up to returning Australians and anyone else that had been issued a visa to get a spot on a plane and make their way here. Those very, very limited spots and places on planes. So, in fact, the government had no process or procedure for prioritising Australians
being able to take those flights. Anyone with a valid visa to Australia was able to hop on uh, those flights. So when they say, when they have said stranded Australians would be at the front of the queue, this was a falsehood, and I think many Australians would see it as an absolute slap in the face. So it's all very well for this government to blame the states for their caps. Uh, I have to say, with the lack of support that the Commonwealth has given, the complete non-support for creating uh, Commonwealth places. Uh, instead, our nation has entirely had to rely on the places created by the states. Uh, as Jane Holton uh, revealed, in uh, revealed in her report, travellers can be quarantined under either Commonwealth or state or territory legislation. It was highlighted in her report that it is indeed a viable option for this government to be setting up Commonwealth uh, quarantine facilities. And I simply do not take at face value what those opposite have said, that they've tried and they've looked hard enough at doing that. I know those opposite have raised the fact that Christmas Island uh, is full with its uh, legitimate immigration uses. Well, I have to say, uh, that, may, that may well be the case, but why not, why not move people who don't need quarantining for COVID purposes? There are any number of different options that you could potentially look at in order to get Australians home. There are uh, any number of locations around the country that I think could be a viable place in which to conduct quarantine uh, under Commonwealth legislation. And yet, and yet, this Christmas. Thank you, any... Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I speak to the issue of Australians stranded overseas. The health and safety of our Australians, both at home and abroad, is the government's number one priority in these unprecedented times. Global travel and border restrictions that were introduced to curb COVID-19 resulted in a consular emergency unparalleled in its scale and in its complexity. Without these measures, the pandemic would have hit our nation much harder. We recognise the caps agreed by National Cabinet are making it harder for people to return. We're keenly aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of global travel restrictions. Many Australians, though, have been able to return, more than 432,000 since the government advised Australians to reconsider their travel needs. DFAT has helped over 31,000 Australians return on over 370 flights, including almost 11,000 people on government-facilitated flights. Ten commercial flights have been facilitated by government since 23 October returning 1,583 Australians to our shores, including a Qantas flight from London that landed in Darwin today with 165 passengers on board, and a Qantas flight from Delhi that landed in Darwin on Saturday with 148 passengers. Since National Cabinet on 18 September, over 39,600 Australians have returned home. Melbourne Airport, our second largest, has not been taking international arrivals since July. And we're pleased, though, that the Victorian government is now working towards 1,120 passengers per week in arriving on commercial flights from 7 December, and further flights will follow. Madam Acting Deputy President, the outrage that's being feigned by the oppos opposition is rather juvenile in this crisis, particularly since the mismanagement of the crisis has resulted in states remaining closed to travellers. Labor would have you believe that Australians have been abandoned by the federal government when we all know that it's the Labor premiers running their own dictatorships that have hampered our nation's recovery. We saw what happened when Victoria's Dan Andrews tried to process returned and international travellers and the debacle that followed. Processing quarantined Australians is an important role 
for responsible leaders. In Queensland, Princess Palaszczuk's desire to close the borders to ensure her own re-election saw Australians and Queenslanders locked out of their homes, and not just the international travellers who wanted to return home. We witnessed families with small children torn apart, the dying denied rights to be with their loved ones in their final moments, and the carnage that the closure of Queensland's borders has caused to the tourism businesses that's yet to be fully realised. What chance did Queenslanders stranded in foreign countries have? The answer is none. And the biggest overreaction has been in WA, where Premier Mark McGowan has traded the needs of travellers with a personal popularity contest proving more enticing than responsible leadership. It's interesting now that it's Labor demanding a solution that is truly of its own making. New South Wales has been doing an exceptionally strong job processing international travels. In fact, it has been holding up the absolute weight of this task for the nation. Its excellent record in managing the health crisis, superior contact tracing and a measured approach to closures means they have been carrying the quarantine burden for these failed Labor-led states. The global pandemic is far from over. And we cannot guarantee when international travel will return to a level of normalcy. However, infrastructure, the ABF and DFAT will continue to work to relocate and use any spare capacity to get vulnerable clients on board as a priority. We're helping vulnerable Australians overseas by facilitating access to flights to Australia and providing financial assistance where required through the hardship program and our consular staff are to be commended for their efforts during this time. The Morrison government is committed to helping Australians to ensure that they can come home as quickly and as safely as possible. Even in the absence of sensible state Labor governance, and we will continue to do that until all Australians are home. The question is that the um Motion be agreed to. All that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it.